welcome to the Global Day of Jewish Learning. Uh, I'm Rabbi Pinchas Alush from Scottsdale, Arizona, the Rabbi of Congregation Beth Tefillah. It's truly an honor uh, for us all year in this room, our congregation, to be a part of this uh, wonderful and historic day of uh, Global Day of Jewish Learning, uh, spearheaded by Rabbi Steinzeltz and the Adler Society. It's uh, moving, to say the least, to have thousands of Jews worldwide unite in Torah learning, have our minds unite with God's mind. And uh, for that, we thank Rabbi Steinbelt, the Adler Society, and all who are involved. I'd personally like to thank Josh Lesavoy, who's here with us, the CIO, that's how you say it, right, Josh? The CIO of um, United Web, United Web Corporation, where our class here is taking place today. So thank you, Josh, for spearheading this with uh, Lily, the, the tech part of it. But um, as you can tell, you have source sheets. I just want to begin by saying that you should have source sheets here on the table and also online. You have a source sheet uh, with our references for today regarding this title of Four Biblical Mothers. Because what I'd like to do today is really focus on maybe uh, an overlooked part of the Bible in which we find four biblical mothers weeping, crying. And you know, I have to say that the Bible is not big on emotions. You don't find many people expressing their emotions, not in the Torah, not in the Nevi'im, and not in the Ketuvim, not in any part of the Bible. Maybe the reason for that is because the Torah emphasizes actions more than emotions. It knows that at the end of the day, people are defined much more by their actions than by their emotions. In fact, at uh, funerals and uh, in obituaries, when people are really defined and well remembered, they are remembered mainly by their actions, not so much by their emotions. Maybe this is the message here of the Torah, but still, you have four biblical mothers crying. And the fact that the Torah emphasizes their cry demands our attention. And uh, I'd like to begin with the first one, the a story that we read just a few weeks ago, just last week, I believe. In, um, in the portion of the week in the parsha, where we read of Hagar crying. If you recall, Hagar was the maidservant of Abraham, who also eventually married Abraham on the instruction of Abraham's wife, Sarah, who could not have children. And Sarah turns to Abraham and says, well, why don't uh, you uh, have uh, a relationship with Hagar so that at least you can have some continuity because obviously it won't come from me. Hagar has a child with Abraham. His name is Ishmael. But soon enough, God blesses Sarah, the elderly woman, as you remember. And uh, she too has a son with Abraham, Isaac. That's the name, Yitzchak. Yitzchak and Ishmael now are raised in the same home. They have the same father, not the same mother. And uh, Sarah, the mother of Yitzchak, realizes that Ishmael, the son of Hagar, is having bad influence on uh, Isaac, her own son, her own biological son. So she tells Abraham, we have, to, we have to expel them. We don't want them in our home. They're having bad influence on Isaac. Um, Abraham doesn't know what to do. And then God exclaims to Abraham, as you remember, a uh, line that many Jewish husbands uh, like to be uh, reminded of sometimes. But she says, God says to Abraham, God says to Abraham, Shema Bekola, whatever Sarah tells you to do, you should listen to her voice. Listen to your wife. Sarah told you to expel Hagar and Ishmael. They're expelled. Hagar and Ishmael now are walking in the desert, and this is the first reference here. And uh, they are desolate, they are desperate. And uh, they, in fact, Ishmael seems to be very sick. He's a 17-year-old boy then, but he still seems to be very sick to the point that he doesn't even help Agar carry any of their possessions. And uh, fortunately, he's about to die. Agar, seeing her son about to pass on, she puts him in a corner and distances herself away from him physically. She just can't stand the sight of seeing her own son, her own 17-year-old son, die. And this is now what the reference says, Genesis 21, 16. And she, Hagar, went and sat her down over against him a good way off, distances herself from him. As it were a bow shot, for she said, let me not look upon the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice 
and wept. Here we are, the first biblical mother crying. She's crying. Crying, does not know what will happen to her son. She knows that uh, her, his death is imminent, and she cries a cry of despair. Fine, that's the first biblical mother crying. What's the message? Why is God emphasizing her emotion? In fact, it's interesting because uh, the Talmud uh, relates what exactly occurred in the heavens during this moment. And the angels were telling God, let him die. Ishmael is on the brink of death. Let him expire. Why so? Because his children and his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren will be a nuisance to the Jewish people. So eliminate the disease now. Eliminate the decree now. And let him die like this. He won't have any descendants. It will bother the Jewish people. God says, no, that's not the way I function, which has a deep lesson in it. I function and judge the person upon that which he is at the moment. I don't I judge a person for that which he can become, but rather for that which he is. Ishmael now is a pure child. There's nothing wrong with him. So for that, I will judge him towards life. He is given a second chance, and miraculously, as we read later in the Bible, uh, an angel appears and quenches his thirst, and he's able to really rebuild his life. An interesting message, by the way, that God judges, judges us according to the present, not necessarily according to the future, even if our future may seem dark and bleak. But that's mother number one, crying. Mother number two, crying, has even more of a mystery. And this is the story of the mother of Sisra. If you recall, but the biblical episode is quite fascinating. Here we find really one of the first Jewish woman uh, leaders in the Bible in which uh, Devorah, Deborah, the prophet or um, uh, the leader of the Jewish people during her time, this is the, during the 12th century BCE, she calls upon Barak, uh, one of the great warriors of the time, and says to Barak, we know that the king Khatzor, the king of the Canaanites, are uh, currently conquering the land of Israel, and reign in the land of Israel, but it is time now for the Jewish people to finally lift their heads up high and to reconquer the land from the Canaanites and from the evil uh, King Khatzar and his army. This was a daunting task because the Jews stood no chance. But Deborah, with her prophecy, promises Barak, you can do it. If you lead the Jews in war against the Canaanites now during the 12th century BCE to reconquer the land of Israel from the Canaanites, God will make you prevail. Barak tells Deborah, fine, I'll launch this war against them, but only if you come with me. She agrees. Devorah joins Barak in, uh, in, 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 this, in leading this war, and they prevail. They prevail also because of another Jewish woman, not just Devorah, but also because of Yael. Yael was a woman who came from a family that was close to the king of the Canaanites, King Chatzor, and um, there she sees the armies marching, both the army of the Canaanites and the army of the Jews marching and, and uh, leading a war against one another. She sees that the Canaanites are losing the war miraculously. She decides, well, it's time to put an end to this war. I'm going to capture their general, Sisra, tempt him, lure him into my house, kill him, and that will signify the end of this war. And finally, the victory of the Jewish people over the Canaanites. What she does is that she walks outside her home and she tells Sisra, who immediately recognizes her, why don't you come into my house? I'll treat you. I know you're fleeing the enemy. You can hide here and eventually maybe regain your control and launch this fight against, again against the Jews. He recognizes Yael and he thinks that Yael, being one of them, being at least close with her family, being close to King Khatzor, that uh, he'll be safe. Sisra walks into, accepts the invitation, walks into Yael's home, and obviously being exhausted from the battle, he falls into a deep sleep. As he is sleeping, Yael courageously takes a little weapon and a little knife and kills Sisra during his sleep through his temple. 
As soon as he, she confirms his death, she then calls Barak, the leader of the Jews, and says, I have the one you are seeking. I have your enemy in my hands, dead. Barak walks into the home of Yael. He shows, he, she shows him uh, the dead Sisra, and that's basically how the war ends and how the victory indeed is confirmed for the Jewish people. But what's interesting is that the Bible decides to focus rather on a mysterious aspect of this war. On who? On the mother of Sisra, awaiting her son to come home after this war, thinking that he again will be victorious since he's, of course, the ever-winning general. And the, judge, the, the verses in the book of Judges really explain this in a, in a very fascinating way. And this is what it says. Again, it's exploring the emotions of the mother of Sisra awaiting her son to come home, her general, the son, the general, to come home, not knowing that he might have been killed by the hands of Yael. This is what the verses say. This is the second reference here on the first sheet. Through the window peered Sisra's mother. Behind the lattice she cried out, <clears throat> Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariots delayed? The wisest of her ladies answer her, Indeed, she keeps saying to herself, Are they not finding and dividing the spoils? A woman or two for each man. Colorful garments is plunder for Sisra. Colorful garments embroidered. Highly embroidered garments for my neck. All this is plunder. She's wondering, well, maybe he's thinking he's delaying to come home because he's still... He, obviously, he won, but he's still exploring the treasures left from the war, from the enemy, the Jews, and he's gathering those treasures to bring home, the colorful garments and so on. She doesn't know that he was killed. This is a painful, painful moment for the mother of Sisra. But then the poem here, composed by Devoran Barak, concludes, So may all your enemies perish, Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength, then the land at peace for 40 years. Sisra's mother is left in anguish. She really is, is almost killed by her suspense. The Torah doesn't tell us, the Tanakh does not tell us what eventually happened to the mother of Sisra. But it chooses for some mysterious reason to focus on her cry, to focus on those moments of, of painful anguish. And the question is, of course, why? Why would the Torah emphasize that during a war in which we were victorious? Leave the enemy alone. It's enough that we beat them. Do you have to go into the thickness of their pain, of their feelings, of their emotions? Why do so? And again, it's the same with Hagar. Why focus on her agony? Fine. The son survived. God judged him as he was in that moment. Let life continue. But what's even more interesting to make the question even stronger is that the Talmud asserts that the cry of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is based on what? On the cry of the, of, of the mother of Sisra. On the cry of one of our enemies' mothers. That's why we blow one type of blows in the shofar. The, the blow of the shevarim. Remember that blow of two, two, two? That's based on the cry of Sisra's mother right here in the book of Judges. Why? Rosh Hashanah, the, one of the holiest days of the year, will be focusing on your mother's, on, the, on, on, on the, the mother of your enemy, on her cry, on this mysterious moment. Let's read the Talmudic passage, which again intensifies the question. Said Abaya, this is from the chapter of Rosh Hashanah 32b. Said Abaya, about this they do indeed differ. Uh, differ. For it is written, it is a day of blowing the shofar, which in the Aramaic translation it is, it is a day of sounding the alarm. Now let's pay attention to the word, the alarm, that cry, that sigh. In Aramaic, it is yevava. Now it is written, Talmud again, finds a parallel between this type of blowing of the shofar, the tu tu tu, to the cry of Sisra. Now it is written concerning the mother of Sisra. The mother of Sisra moaned, using the same word, same word, vateyabev. Right? Vateyabeb, referring to that specific sign. This word, one explains to mean a protracted groan, shevarim, and another to mean a short wail. In any case, what the Talmud is doing here is that it's finding a parallel between the cry of Sisra's mother 
to the Shavarim. Is that what we're about? Focusing on our enemy? Shouldn't we focus on what we are for, the goodness that we have, especially on this day of the year in which we try and return to God so deeply, so profoundly? If that really doesn't make sense. See, but I believe that really to answer this question, we need to contrast those two cries of two non-Jewish mothers in the Bible, that for some reason the Bible brings them to, their center, to its center stage. We need to contrast those two cries with two other cries, cries of Jewish mothers instead. Because again, the, Tam the Bible emphasizes two other cries mysteriously, not knowing why, although it does not focus on, emo on, on emotions too much as mentioned before, but yet it finds it meaningful to focus on the cry of Rachel, a matriarch, and of Hannah. Hannah, whom we also read about during uh, the services of Rosh Hashanah, during the Haftarah of Rosh Hashanah. But let's read about Rachel's cry, which is a cry that seems to be slightly different than the cry of Hagar and the cry of Sisra's mother. This is what Jeremiah says about Rachel's cry. So this is now, uh, we're on the second sheet of the source sheet, the first reference at the top of the second sheet. This is what Jeremiah says about Rachel's cry. Different cry. A voice is heard on high. Lamentation, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children, for they are not. Rachel is weeping on behalf of her children. In fact, the commentaries say that that's why she was buried on the way to Hebron, in between Jerusalem and Hebron, in Bethlehem. Not many of you may have been on her tomb, but uh, she is buried there. Why? Because she refused to rest in peace. She forever wanted to be with her children along the passage, along the journeys of their lives, to be with them in their sorrows and to be able to truly stand as their ambassador, as their representative in heavens, and cry with them, not just for them. And this is what it says. So she refuses to be comforted for her children. She, until this very day, refuses to be comforted for her children. And then God responds to her cry by saying, so says, so says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is reward in your work, says the Lord, and they shall come back. They, the Jewish people that you are crying for, shall come back from the land of the enemy. And there is hope for your future, says God, and the children shall return to their own border, v'shavu banim likvulam. That's a different cry. It's a distinct cry. The cry of Rachel is not the same cry as the cry of Agar or the cry of Sisra's mother. How so? This I believe, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong, but this I believe is a cry not of anguish, not of despair, but quite the opposite. It is a cry of hope, a cry of action. Rachel cries, doesn't want to be comforted. She's there standing for her children. She wants action. She wants God's promise that, the, the, that his children should return to their land, to their borders. It's a whole different type of cry. And we find the same type of cry with the other Jewish biblical mother that is crying, the cry of Hannah. And if you recall the scene again, Hannah, it's a very different cry, but Hannah is there. She's a barren woman. She's part of, uh, of, of uh, the, the families that are well tied, well connected to the Mishkan in the times of Eli, the priest, to the tabernacle. And she goes on to pray so that God can finally bless her with a child. She's been barren for so many years. She wants a child. And she cries and cries. Eli, the priest, thinks that she's, uh, in fact, drunk because she prays and cries silently. But again, the Bible focuses on her cry for some reason, although it doesn't focus on many cries. And this is what the description of the Bible is on Hannah's prayer. It's, uh, the words are just, uh, just heart-wrenching. But this is what it says. Crushed in soul, the second reference here on the source sheet on the second page. Samuel 1, 10 to 11. Crushed in soul, Hannah prayed to God and cried and cried inconsolably. Then she made a vow. And this is the emphasis of the verse, I believe. Then she didn't just cry, but her cry was carried with a vow. Then she made a vow. Oh, God of the angel of, of the angel armies, if you'll take a good hard look at my pain, if you'll quit neglecting me, 
and go into action for me, I'll give him, uh, by giving me a son, I'll give him completely and reservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. What does she do? She doesn't just cry, but she transforms a cry into a promise, into a promise for God, saying that if you really fulfill my prayers, I will act upon them. I will act upon your granting my prayers. I won't just stand there in the distance watching the disaster evolve around me like Hagar did, but I'd rather take a, a, an active part in fulfilling my cries and transforming them into triumph. I think this is why the Torah really makes a very clear distinction between four different cries. On the one hand, we have the cry of Hagar and the cry of Sisra's mother, cries of despair, cries of anguish. While on the other hand, we have cries of hope, of, of belief in the future, and of action too, in which they translate their tears into refusal to be cons consolated, into refusal to, to fall into despair, but rather to, into vows, into promises that can really transform their agony into hope and into triumph. And I have to, to really recall the story of uh, the Kotzke Rebbe, one of, uh, I know, Rabbi Steinlitz's favorite Rebbe's too, Rabbi Menachem Morgan Stern, who passed away 18, in 1859 after 19 years of complete seclusion. The Kotzke Rebbe was one of those uh, mysterious Rebbe's. He was a seeker of truth. He had no patience for any superficiality or lies. But uh, the Kotzke Rebbe secluded himself 19 years before his death. Throughout 19 years, he had almost no contact with anyone. Uh, no one knew exactly what he did during those 19 years, but he was uh, involved in complete meditation and, and didn't want to engage himself with the world too much because, again, he simply despised lies. But the Kotzke Rebbe had a dear friend. His name was Rabbi Yitzchak Ovorke, another great Hasidic master. Rabbi Yitzchak Ovorke's uh, grave is found today in Poland. My, my father actually had uh, the privilege of, of visiting it a few months ago. It's a special place, a holy place. Rabbi Yitzchak Ovorke was Rabbi, uh, the Kotzke Rebbe's dear friend. And he passed away during those 19 years of his seclusion, of the Kotzke Rebbe's seclusion. And, uh, for 30 days, they cried over his passing. And after 30 days, the Kotzke Rebbe was visited by Rabbi Yitzchak of Orke's son, Mendel. Mendel of Orke. Mendel of Orke went to visit the Kotzke Rebbe and said, look, I know you were close to my father who passed away 30 days ago, but something is, is sitting on my heart. My father hasn't visited me once. I would expect a dream from my father. I would accept a sign. But nothing. It's almost as if after his death, he disappeared. Can you explain this to me, Kotzke Rebbe? And the Kotzke Rebbe said, well, you're not alone, Mendel. I was very close. I was a close friend to your father, too. And he also hasn't visited me, not even in a dream. So what I decided to do is to go up to the heavens. I went up to the heavens, the Kotzke Rebbe tells Mendel. And I went to sit next to Rashi. And I asked Rashi, the great biblical commentary, have you seen my father? He's passed on. Have you seen, sorry, my friend, the Rabbi Yitzchak of Arke, he's passed on, but he hasn't visited me. Rashi said, yes, actually, he was just here in my chambers in heaven, but he just left. Fine. So he goes on to the chamber of Maimonides, the Rambam. So have you seen my father? And Rambam tells him, actually, yes, he was just here, but he just left. He says, fine, I might go elsewhere. The Kotzke Rebbe goes elsewhere. He goes to the chambers of Abraham, our forefather. He says, have you seen Rabbi Yitzchak of Orke, my dear friend? Avram says, same thing. He was just here, but he left. But I can tell you where he is. After leaving this chamber, he went to walk in a very dark forest far, far away from you. Maybe you're catching there, and he points to the direction of the forest. The Kotzke Rebbe follows the path, and he's led to this very big, dark forest. At the very end of the forest, he sees an endless sea. And right by the sea, by the shores of the sea, he sees his dear friend, Rabbi Yitzchak Avorke. 
He approached him and says, Rabbi Yitzchak Kavorke, my dear friend, we, we are waiting to hear from you, a signal, something. Your son Mendel is also waiting to hear from you. Where have you disappeared? Rabbi Yitzchak Kavorke answers, Kotzka Rebbe, they in the heavens. He says, well, you see the sea? The sea is a sea of tears. It's a sea of tears that were gathered from the Jewish people's history. Every tear that a Jew cries on the exile, on his pain, on the destruction of the temple, it is gathered here in the sea. Just before I died, he tells the Kotzka Rebbe there in heaven, I made a promise that I will not go up into my chamber to bask in God's light until God answers my prayers on behalf of the Jewish people, until he pays attention to the sea of tears. So I'm here. That's why I haven't come to visit you. And that's why I haven't visited my son either. But this is a Jewish cry. Rabbi Tchak your body is ready. Those cries, those tears of Rachel and of Hannah. Tears that refuse to be consolated, to be comf comforted. They want action and they will stand for their principle until their wish is granted. You may have heard also of the story of, of, of uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik, one of the great celebrated poets of, of Israel, who celebrated until today, but he has a little song called Shirati. Shirati means my song. And there he describes of uh, uh, the, the art of kvetching, you know, the art of kvetching, of, of krechtsing, as they say in Yiddish, the art of the Jewish side, which obviously no one of us uh, uh, experiences. Um, except from our children sometimes, maybe. But uh, <laughs> my son is here, so. No, but the art of crafting is really a, a unique Jewish art. And uh, he asks the question, where did I inherit this art? I'm not, I'm not a craft, I'm not a craft, I'm not a kvetch, I'm not a psi too. Huh? Where did it come from? Is it in my genetics? Is it in my DNA? And then he remembers in the song, in this poem, he remembers as a child, as a seven-year-old child, he went to sleep, but I was, was awoken by his mother's cries. His mother worked very hard. She had lost her husband. And she had to raise her four children by herself. She was working morning until the evening, until late at night. And she would come home late. And sometimes uh, Chaim Nachman would not see her until the next day. But he was awoken once by her tears. So she, she, he goes and he hides behind the kitchen door to watch his mother cry. There he is. And he's watching his mother not just crying, but baking challah for Shabbos, kneading the dough. She's kneading the dough and kneading the dough. And as, she, as she's kneading the dough, she's crying for her children. And she says, God, you make me work so, work so hard. But please, make this work fulfill itself so that my children can be true, God-fearing people. And she's kneading the dough. And as she's kneading the dough, she's crying. And as she's crying, she's praying. But as she's praying, her tears are flowing down into the dough. That Shabbos, Chaim Nachman ate at Chaim. He says, that's where I got the art of crafting from. See, the tears of my mother were in the chala that I ate on that Shabbos. But in fact, these are tears, these are cries of true prayer, of, of focus on the future. These are cries of Jews. And I believe that that is why, see, there's an interesting, a quite, quite, a quite a fascinating, I would say quite a, a, a challenging verse in Exodus, a verse in which uh, we are told of Moses being on the Nile River after her mother could not hide him anymore. She places him, as you remember, on the Nile River in a basket. And there um, the daughter of Pharaoh finds him. Do you remember that scene? The daughter of Pharaoh finds him. But it's quite interesting. How does she find him? She went out to bathe in the Nile River. And how does she find him? She doesn't see him first. First she hears a cry. And she turns her head and she says, oh boy, let's read the verse here. And she, she goes, she says, oh, there's, there's a, something floating. So she went to that something, to that basket. In Exodus 2.6, this is the last reference on the sheet. She opened it and saw it, even the child, and behold, a boy that wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And my question to you is this, on this verse, well, if you look at the Hebrew, maybe the translation is more, the, the, the Hebrew itself, obviously, is more accurate than the translation. But it says, She says that, oh, here, 
she sees the child and she sees her cry, his cries. First, don't you hear cries? You really see cries? The grammar is inaccurate. It should say, see. I mean, it should say, hear, sorry, not see the cry. And secondly, how did she immediately know that this was a Jew? This was a Hebrew. This is one of the Hebrew's children. How did she know? It's quite, I mean, quite interesting. So maybe because he was floating on Nile River, and not all babies float on Nile River, maybe Jews were trying to, but, but there's a deeper commentary. And that is, you see, when Jews cry, they cry differently. The powerful message here. When Jews cry, they cry is a cry of promise, not of despair. And that's how she knew that this was a Hebrew. This was a Jew. And that's why she sees. She doesn't just hear. She sees within the cry the future. She sees the boy. She sees his tears. But she can also see the future and not just hear it. This is the power of a Jewish cry. You know, there's... there's Many of them, many, many verses, but I think Rabbi Steinsatz also once told me that his uh, favorite chapter in the book of Psalms is a chapter that I would encourage everyone to read, chapter 139, Kuf And chapter 139 speaks of God's ever presence in the world and in our personal journeys. And there it says, there's a verse that says that, I should have brought it maybe as one of the references, but it says that, Imisak Shamayim Sham Ata. If I flee to the heavens, God, I see you there. And if I fall into despair, here you are also. What King David is trying to emphasize is exactly this. During our times of joy, our times of bliss, we might be in the heavens and we might see God there. That's easy. But when you go down to the abyss, to the uh, wells of despair, Remember, Hineka, God is just as much present as he was in the heavens. He is there. And that thought alone is really what gives us the motivation, the conviction, the determination to continue on and not just cry, but really transform my tears into tears of triumph. And um, there's a Kabbalistic commentary that says, you know what the word for, for tears or for, for cry is in Hebrew? Bechi, it's mentioned here in the verses. Bechi, Rachel mevakal baneha. Right? Bechi, or Bechia. Bechia, or Bechi itself, the word for cry again in Hebrew, can be divided into two. Becha, Bach, Bet, Chaf, and then Yud, or Yud, He. Becha, Yud. In you, there is a Yud, or there is a Yud, He. Yud, He are the letters of God. Yud is the letter of God. In you, in your sorrow, you will find the Yud, you will find God. If you're only to, able to focus inward and not just outward from a distance, but inward, in your own soul, you'll find the solution, you'll find the key to the future, and you'll be able to transform your pain, your darkness, into true light. And I'll just conclude with the story, and then I'll tell, we'll field some questions uh, from uh, both this room and all over the world, since we're connected here to... Uh, many, many places in the world. But a um, story that I had the privilege of hearing from the person himself, I remember that uh, when I lived in South Africa, uh, we had a special guest come to speak to the students once. I was, I think, 11 years old. But this special guest was uh, a man named Nissan Mengel. And he came to tell us about his Holocaust story. He was a Holocaust survivor. And he told us how he miraculously survived the Holocaust, although he had met face to face. Dr. Mengele, the evil doctor who decided which uh, way people should go, whether to life or whether to death at the entrance of Auschwitz, as many of you know. But he had met Dr. Mengele twice. He almost was sent to death, but miraculously was sent to life, even though he was just 10 years old when he met him. And uh, Lisa Mengele is telling us his story about how at the very end of the war, the Germans knew that they were losing. So they decided to send the Jews on this death of march, uh, death, uh, march of death, sorry, from Poland to from Germany to Poland, sorry, from Poland to Germany, and they were there walking in the dark winter nights. Many of them fell to their death alongside the march. Just couldn't stand the torture, couldn't stand the cold, couldn't stand the starvation. Nissan Mengele, as an 11-year-old boy, was one of them. 
I remember him telling us the story of how he almost fell to the ground. He felt that his legs were broken. And he was at the mercy of an eight-year-old boy from Czechoslovakia next to him. He really supported him, carried him along the way so that Nissan wouldn't die. And as he was being carried by this eight-year-old boy, he told us the story. He remembered her story from his childhood, from his earlier childhood, in which uh, he would uh, hear his father recount a fascinating tale by the Baal Shem Tov. His father would recount the tale apparently repeatedly, time and time again, almost every week over the Shabbat dinner. And there in that tale, he found, he saw, now in this death march, Baal Shem Tov, who was visited by a dear disciple of his, a dear student, who uh, his wife was pregnant, and as uh, the Baal Shem Tov and the student were reuniting with one another, the student is approached by a midwife saying, hey, you may have left your house too soon. Your wife is about to give birth. You better run back to her and help her. The student says, what? It's a soon. What should I do? Going back now in the darkness of the night is dangerous. The way is filled of dangers, filled up of, of, God forbid, of, of robbers and so on. I don't know if to walk back. I don't know if it's safe. Baal Shem Tov says to him, yes, of course. Of course it's safe. You're going to help your wife give birth. And you should know as you're walking in that darkness of the forest, a Jew never walks alone. A Jew never walks alone. The Hasid went back and was able to face the darkness of the journey safely and help his wife. But his father, Nissan Mangel's father, would tell him, you see, wherever you are in life, and I don't know where life will take you, but remember, a Jew never walks alone. As he was marching on this death, on this march of death, being carried by an eight-year-old boy because his legs simply could not take it, he was revitalized simply by those words uttered by the Baal Shem Tov, a Jew never walks alone. So here we have four cries. Cries of despair. On the other hand, cries of hope. It gives us that hope is that a Jew really never walks alone. Becha, Yud, in you there's a God. In you there's hope. In you there's a prayer yet to be uttered. In you there's a principle yet to be stand for, stood, uh, yet, yet to be cherished and, and vocalized to the world. In you there's a leader. There's a leader that stands by a sea of tears and knows that it is not a time for despair, not a time for comfort, but a time to truly actualize yourself and stand for yourself, stand for your generations to come. And then if we are able to truly learn from those two biblical mothers, from Rachel and from Hannah, in contrast to the other two biblical mothers of the, of the mother of Sisra and Hagar, we're able to learn from their cries, then in that cry we'll not only discover that Yud, or that Yud Hey, the God within us, the God that walks with us at all times, but also be able to discover the promise of God to Rachel, the Shavu, Banim, Likvulam, and the children of Israel will return and be embraced by Israel's borders speedily in our days. Amen, Amen. Okay, what I'd like to do now is uh, field some questions. What we can do is we can begin with questions in this, Josh, if it's okay with you. We can uh, begin with questions here in this room and then transition to questions. Uh, from around the world, unless unless we have questions that all of a sudden pop up and if you have the big red letters are oh. urgent, <laughs> then, we can, then we can attend to them too. But any questions from this room first? We'll give congregation, but the fila you're in Scottsdale, precedence. So, Rabbi, yeah. <clears throat> why do you think Hashem gave us the, the ability or the, what, why are tears, why is crying part of our makeup as humans? Why do we all the different faculties we have, why do we need to cry? Uh, the question was, why did God give us that ability to cry? Why, why the need to cry? I think that, you know, cries, well, well any expression of emotion is, is actually healthy. In a way, it's, it's, it's cleansing. It, uh, it is a cleansing exercise. But I, 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 look, I, it's a good question. I mean, that's more of a psychological question. I don't think 
I'm a psychologist to answer that. But I do, I do agree, I would agree with psychologists that tears is a healthy process in, in um, many, uh, many, many ways, many diverse ways. Um, I remember that when I was a rabbinical student in Italy, there was a, a man who marched into our, our uh, yeshiva one morning and he showed us his poem. His poem was Tears Shed Eyes. That was the name of his poem. I think I still have it somewhere. But I agree with that. The tears shed eyes. They shed, they cleanse eyes. And they are able to, to allow us to see the, see the world with a new light, with a new life, perhaps. Any other questions? Are these the only four incidents of crying in the color that you just pulled these up? Or you just chose these. Four. That's a good question. No, it's not the only incidence of crying. As I said before, good question. Um, the question was, are these the only four incidents of crying in the Torah? No, they are not. Uh, you, you may be familiar with Joseph's tears. Joseph, upon seeing his brothers for the first time, they did not recognize him. He recognized them. He couldn't withstand himself, and he erupted in tears. Uh, but that's, that's, I think that's, that's rare. It's quite rare to find the Torah describing not just tears, but describing emotions in general. In the entire Torah, in the entire Bible, in the Tanakh. Uh, I also think that, again, as mentioned before, it's purposeful. Because the Torah doesn't like emphasizing emotions. What defines us is not our emotions. What defines us is our actions. We are what we do, not what we feel. Not even what we think. In Descartes' words, cogito ergo sum. But we are what we do. You know, they once asked Arnold Palmer, the famous golfer, how come he's so good at golf? And uh, he said, I'm not good, I'm just lucky. And then he thought for a while, he said, but you know, it's funny. The harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. I think uh, our actions eventually define who we are. The harder we work at them, the luckier we'll be too. Any other questions? Do you think it's easier to cry when we're younger as opposed to, it seems children cry a lot more easily than adults. As we get older, it's harder to tap into those feelings and, and, and shed those tears and then really be in touch with, with uh, that emotion. Whereas children, it sort of you know, blows and right. bursts out. Right. There's no doubt that children are much more in tune with life in general, with their soul in general, than, than, than adults. Um, as, but I'll, I'll tell you this. What, what uh, really impresses me with the tears of children is not so much the tears, I wish adults could have the same thing, is that they cry, they cry maybe bitterly, but uh, they get over it very quickly, very quickly, whether it's cries of wanting an ice cream, or cries of my uh, friend hurt my feelings, they'll be best friends a second after that, and they'll get over the ice cream a second after that too, or maybe two seconds after that. But adults <laughs> takes us forever to get over our tears sometimes. And that's really what we should be learning from children. The wise man once said that, how come, how come children are able to make up with their friends so quickly, while adults, it takes them years sometimes. And the answer of this wise man was, it's uh, quite simple. See, children prefer being happy over being right, while adults have to be right over being happy. And that's why. But uh, we should learn not just from their tears, but also from the way they uh, are able to overcome them. Yeah. You could almost say that uh, Hannah had a punch from the chair, cry, cry for, for action, for, right. as opposed to the other cry, more infantile cry. Right. That's, that's very true. Very true, yeah. Hannah, Hannah has a beautiful cry. I mean, it's a heart wrenching cry. But here yeah, she takes action even before her, her prayers are, are granted. She makes a vow, she makes a nether. She knows she has a vision for the child yet to be born. It's, it's, it's just inspiring. It's really amazing. I think I have to say that that's why, you see, the, maybe we, we answered this, this question indirectly, but to be more direct, see the shivarim, that cry that emulates that cry of the shofar, that emulates the cry of Sisra's mother, is followed by a takia, by a long cry, uninterrupted cry, maybe to tell us that yes, we can have cries of despair, we, we, we've all been there, right? We've all been 
in that situation where, where we don't know where our child is. He hasn't been, he hasn't come home yet. I'm guilty of that as a teenager many times from parents. Oh, where is he? But, or is our job secure? Is our health secure? We've been there. We've been there. But we can't let that define us. We have to have a tekiah that follows immediately after the shavarim. We have to have a long, certain, and, and uh, uh, the promising cry that follows the shavarim or the yavavai in the words of the Talmud. Why do you think, I, mean, I know you already talked about it a little bit, but why does God, Hashem, show so much compassion for Cicero's mother when she's not even theoretically one of his children, well, I guess everybody's one of God's children. Right. But I mean, it's such a, it seems to be such a huge portion of, uh, as you say, it's part of Rosh Hashanah, it's part of uh, a significant amount of our history now, and, and meaning this is one chapter in our history that's not, not even uh, one of our quote unquote heroes. It's right. In fact, the opposite of that. It's, it's showing that is this a way of showing that God is compassionate, of compassionate, or the right? It's a good question. Uh, uh, was your question heard? So, so I don't know. Okay, but but the question is why? Why is God showing so much compassion? Why is He at all emphasizing the cry of Sisra of the of Sisra's mother here on the uh, first page of our uh, uh, references? Um, Look, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, why? But I think there's a lesson. Again, there's a lesson. Maybe to tell us this is a cry that's unacceptable. Or it's a cry that must be followed at least by a takia, by a, a promising cry. Um, maybe it's acceptable only if it follows a takia. But I'll add also that Sisra's mother is innocent here, right? I mean, it's not, it's not her fault that her son became uh, such a warrior. We don't know if it is, at least. So uh, when a mother cries, you know, there's a, a famous Talmudic line that says, Sha'arei d'ma'ot lo ninalu, the gates of tears are never sealed, never locked. They remain always open. Because when there's uh, an earnest cry, God has to pay attention. In fact, another Talmudic line says, Rahmana liba ba'e, God wants the heart. He wants the heart much more than anything else. When we're able to give a heartfelt prayer to God, that to him means everything. And here's a heartfelt prayer, I believe. So God has to accept it, and the Bible maybe has to emphasize it too. He seems to respond to every cry in the Torah. Who, who seems to respond? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, but again, not every cry is mentioned. I mean, very few cries are mentioned. But in this case, yeah. In this case, there's a response of some sort. I don't know if there's a response for Sister's mother rather than, uh, you know, may your enemies be, may your enemies perish. But um, some sort of response, you're right. Yeah. Any other questions? From uh, New Zealand, maybe? <laughs> or somewhere? No, uh, I believe they're having a Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank once again uh, United Web Corporation for hosting this event. I'd also like to thank Josh, in particular, the CIO of uh, United Web, Josh Lesavoy, and uh, everyone who was involved in putting this together, Lily from the Aleph Society, and the Aleph Society in general, Robert Stanz's offices in the United States for uh, hosting this event uh, online, virtually, and um, for, in general, giving us the honor of uh, joining thousands and thousands of Jews around the world in uniting our minds with God's mind as expressed in the Torah so that our life can be uh, more meaningful, purposeful, and also so that we can find the Yud in the Becha, the God in the tears, the light within the darkness. Thank you.